If you have your personal copy of God's Word, please turn with me, if you will, to the book of Luke. The book of Luke, the chapter is 13, and we're going to take a look at verses 10 through 17. Luke, the chapter is 13, and we're going to look at verses 10 through 17. Reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible, there you will find these words. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and there was a woman who had had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid hand, he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, there are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day? And as he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. It is from this passage of Scripture that I would like to preach from the subject, the person, the problem, and the prescription. The person the problem, and the prescription. Our first point, I want to talk about the person. And before I go into who this person is in the text, the one that needed help from Jesus, I want us to first take a look at Romans chapter 2. And the verse is 11. In Romans chapter 2, and the verse is 11, The Bible reads, for God shows no partiality. Or in other words, God is no respecter of persons. As we talk about the person in this text, this person is a woman. And this woman is a person. And notice how this woman in the text remains nameless. I personally believe her name is purposely left out for a few reasons. Number one, I believe her name is left out because God has a way of reiterating a biblical truth in the subtle things he does. Notice how God is no respecter of person. Notice how God shows no partiality. He makes this statement clear throughout Holy Writ at least 11 times, specifically in the New Testament. Yet, it is through many countless examples in the Bible, Jesus would stop what he was doing at that present moment, and he would help somebody. He will heal somebody, and he will deliver some unnamed person throughout the sacred text. 
I believe the second reason why this woman's name is not mentioned is because God wants us to focus not on who she is, but rather to hone in on the fact that this woman in the text is just like us. She could be somebody like we, somebody that we know. She could be like somebody that we know, or she could be just like us. This woman's dilemma is her own, but maybe we can find some point of relativity between her case history and our own history. I mean, the questions that we must ask ourselves on this afternoon are, what have we been struggling with for about 18 years? What have we been dealing with? for a very long time? Or what has troubled us for so many years? This woman is nameless because I believe that at some point we can put our names in her place because we, just like this woman, are people with problems. The Bible teaches us in Luke chapter 13, verse 10, how Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues and in the midst of the congregation was this woman. And what I like about this woman is that she was suffering with this infirmity for 18 years and yet she still made time to worship God and to hear his word. This woman's determination and resolve is quite different than our determination and our resolve in the 21st century. Notice that in the text, her infirmity of 18 years led her to the synagogue. But our headache for 18 minutes keeps us out of the house of God. Her infirmity for 18 years, led her to worship God. But our remaining $18 keeps us from praising the Lord. Her infirmity for the last 18 years led her to Jesus. But our failed relationships, our failed ideas, and our failed plans for the past 18 days keep us from hearing and reading his word. If we simply do what God would have us to do and be where God would have us to be, then we will always be in a position for Jesus to see us as a person with a problem. Notice this woman in the text. She did not allow her problem to pervert her person. She did not allow her pain to pollute her praise. She did not allow her trouble to twist her tribute, but instead she allowed her wound to will her into well-being. Now we are not privy to what this woman's upbringing was or what she had heard in the past, but if we get nothing else out of this message on this afternoon, we must at least get this. For every person, there will be a problem. And for every problem, our God has a prescription. For our God is a perpetual problem solver. And so that brings us now to our second point as we talk about the problem. We know about the person. Now let's talk about the problem. The Bible tells us that this woman has a problem which lasted so long that it produced two more problems. The Bible tells us that she has a disabling spirit and she had this disabling spirit for 18 years. This disabling spirit caused her to be bent over. It changed her posture. 
And not only that, she could not fully straighten herself. So that means that when she tried, she was unsuccessful because she had been in this condition and this situation for so long. First, let us address her gateway problem. Her gateway problem is that she has had this disabling spirit for 18 years. She did not just have a disability, but she was, but she had a disabling spirit. In other words, Satan was the reason for her pain. And we know this because Jesus tells us as much in Luke chapter 13, verse 16, in which Jesus responds to the ruler of the synagogue by saying, and ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day. What has the devil tied us down with and is currently holding against us for the past 18 years? The devil may have been chipping away at your self-esteem for the past 18 years. Satan may have been destroying your marriage for the past 216 months. The evil one may have been trying to raise your kids for the past 936 weeks. The enemy may have been using your job to keep you away from worshiping God for the past 6,570 days. That old serpent may have been setting traps in your life every hour for the past 157,680 hours. That dragon may have been telling lies about you and to you such as you're a nobody, nobody likes you, you'll never be anything. God doesn't love you, you'll never make it, or why bother, there's no hope for you anyway for the past 9,460,800 minutes. The God of this world may have blinded your mind and have convinced you that the Bible isn't right and that there is no God, and when it comes to your finances, you're broke, and it's like that, and that's just the way it is for the past 567,648,000 seconds. Whatever infirmity the devil is using to bind you, today is the day we need to refuse to give the devil another year, another month, another week, another hour, another day, another minute, another second of our lives. My brothers and sisters, this is the year this is the year to regain our confidence. This is the month to take back our marriages. This week is the week that we take back our families. Today is the day that we renew our relationship with God. This hour is the hour that we recognize that Nahum chapter 1 verse 7 is still in the Bible. The Lord is good a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. This minute is the minute we acknowledge that Psalm 31 verse 24 is still in the Bible. Be strong and let your heart take courage. All you that wait on the Lord this second it's the very second we speak with Jesus in Matthew chapter 16, verse 23, where Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. We need to learn to just speak up just like we are to call on God and call on Jesus and be guided by his spirit. Sometimes we just need to tell Satan, Satan, you can't have this congregation. 
Satan, you can't have my spouse. Satan, you can't have my children. Satan, you can't have my hope. Satan, you can't have my joy. Satan, you can't have my soul because my soul has been anchored in the Lord. And now is the time that we need to tell the devil to back off and step off because your infirmity can't live here anymore. The Bible also teaches that this woman not only had a disabling spirit, but that it caused her condition to be bent over. I want us to understand on this afternoon that this woman did not get this way overnight. It took 18 years for an upright woman to be a bent over person. And whatever the devil has bound you with, maybe it causes you to feel differently, look differently, act differently because you have been dealing with it for so long that you can't even remember how it feels not to cry. You can't remember how it feels to have joy. How many of us are walking around life bent over? How many of us have been stabbed in the back so many times by friends and brethren that we don't even try to fight it anymore? We just assume the position. How many of us have been looked past and looked over and looked through so many times for promotions and accolades and awards that we just assume the position? We expect it. How many of us have been used and abused and misused by so-called friends so many times that it hurts to just stand up straight? Well, my brothers and sisters, I stopped by this afternoon just to let you know that we serve a Savior, a Savior named Jesus, who has a balm for our hurt according to Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 22. The Bible further teaches that this woman was so beat down, so beat down by the devil, and so bent over by her disability that she could not fully straighten herself. Oftentimes, people who stand on the outside can easily criticize and assume that this woman is in this position because she didn't try hard enough. She didn't work hard enough, that, that she's in this situation because she lacks effort and fortitude and determination. However, this was not this woman's case. The Bible teaches that she could not straighten herself, which means that she tried to straighten herself, but was unable to pick herself up. Now, don't get me wrong, not everybody who is infirmed and bent over lacks the ability to pick themselves up. Because I'm well aware that there are some hustlers in the house. There, there are some thieves in the temple. I, I know that there are some crooks in the church who simply look to profit off their problems. Oh, woe is, woe is me, I'm single, help me. Oh, woe is me, woe is me, my, my husband, my wife, they don't love me. Uh, woe is me, help me. Oh, you know, my family don't, we don't go anywhere. If you could just help me out. Oh, I, I'm just, I'm unemployed. Well, you need to go get a job. Well, you know, it's just so hard. Nobody in all of Tucson is hiring. And if you could just pay my rent this month, next month, stop the foreclosure, and, you know, just put me on the payroll. It, I, I, I believe God is going to see me through. There are some people that try to profit off their problems. However, this woman simply wanted to be freed from her disability so she can be made straight and glorify God. So we talked about the person, we talked about the problem. Now let's talk about the prescription. The prescription is found in Luke chapter 4 because this is how Jesus first entered the synagogue, what he first spoke about in Luke chapter 4, and the verses are 16 through 21, I want us to see 
the prescription in this text. Luke chapter 4, verse 16 through 21, the Bible reads, And he, he, Jesus, came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Let's talk about the prescription because the prescription that Jesus spoke of in Luke 4, the prescription that Isaiah gave, in the book of Isaiah, the prescription that this woman applied in this text is the same prescription that we need today if we want to be healed of whatever it is that Satan has put on us. The prescription is Jesus because Jesus is the great physician. And as the great physician, Jesus has a perfect prescription that if applied can produce a complete healing and dynamic deliverance in our lives. And so listen to what the great physician has to say. Listen to what the good doctor prescribes. He tells us, number one, that we must uncover the wound. Not only must we uncover the wound, but the second thing is that we must believe the word. My grandmother used to tell me, she used to say, Twan, things covered up don't heal right. Things covered up don't heal right. When I read the text, this text, I find this to be true. I mean, how do we expect God to help us in our trouble, heal us from our hurt, fix our problems, and deliver us from the valley of victimization when we walk around trying to hide our heartache and disguise our disappointments. This woman was bent over in pain, and because she didn't try to hide it, Jesus saw her and called her to himself. Jesus cannot apply his treatment until such a time we uncover the wound. And we see this in James chapter 4, verse 7. And not only that, after we have uncovered our wounds by submitting to God, we must believe the word of God. Notice what Jesus said to this woman. Jesus said to this woman in Luke chapter 13, verse 12, he said, woman, you are freed from your disability. Now notice the order in the text. Jesus didn't say this after he healed the woman, laid hands on her, she straightened up and started to glorify God and began to walk around in a way that she hadn't been able to walk around for the past 18 years. No, Jesus said these words to her before he even touched her. Jesus said these words to her before he even healed her. Jesus said these words to the woman before she was made straight and before she glorified God. In other words, the Holy Spirit is reminding us that we must believe before we can receive. Listen to your Bible in Mark chapter 11, verse 24. Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And this same truth is reiterated in John chapter 1, verse 12 and Acts chapter 10, verse 43. So as I close this message on this afternoon to those of us 
who are spiritually bankrupt? Do we believe the Lord has good news for us? To those of us who are brokenhearted, do we believe the Lord can heal us? To those of us who are held captive by the devil, discouragement, and depression, do we believe the Lord can deliver us? To those of us who are spiritually blind and cannot see afar off, do we believe that the Lord is still in the business of recovering our sight? And to those of us who have been bruised by brutes, brethren, and the beast, do we believe the Lord can still set us at liberty? This woman had to believe the word of Jesus, who told her that the devil's reign in her life was over. We have to believe the prescription will work before we can be made whole. So where do you stand on this afternoon? We have a great physician. Jesus has not lost his license to practice healing in your life. He has not been in the news. He has not been a part of any scandal. He is still in the business of turning your midnight into day. He is still in the business of making your crooked way straight. He is still in the business of picking you up when you are down. He is still in the business of putting you back together again after you have been broken. All we have to do is just show up. See, Jesus is the type of doctor that you don't even need to make an appointment. All you have to do is show up. This woman showed up and Jesus helped her and delivered her even when others criticized her being made whole. And what I see in this text is really what you don't see. Because sometimes the best preaching is in between the lines. Notice that in the text, nowhere in the text that it says that she gets discouraged as a result of what the people were saying about it. Or that she became upset. Or that she never wanted to come back to the synagogue again if this is what people were going to say about her. Or that people were mad because she was made whole. Or that she was beat down spiritually because she had been made whole physically. The text doesn't say anything like that. I believe that this woman, if she was attending the synagogue before she had the infirmity and was regularly attending the synagogue even in the midst of her infirmity, then she had more than enough reason to keep showing up and giving God praise after God has provided the deliverance. And we need some people like that today in the church that don't allow bad things to keep them from the very place where they can receive help. It is pitiful and pathetic thinking. If I'm sick, I got a pain in my chest, and, and I don't want to go to the emergency room. I don't want to go to the hospital. I don't want to seek the help of a doctor. I don't want to go to WebND and try to find out what this could be, and I'm just going to sit around in the pain, or that I just stop worshiping God, or I stop reading his word because all of a sudden I got some pain. If Jesus is our example, what did he do when he was in pain? He just came down from heaven and gave his life as a ransom for all when he was pained by our sin? What did Jesus do when he was pained? He just continued to just hang on that cross with nails through his hands and nails through his feet for three hours until it was finished? What did Jesus do when he was in pain? All he did was just continue to love us and continue to help us until such a time that we trust him to be and to do what he has already done and said that he will do in our lives. 
if that's the example that we must follow, then we are in pain, then can't no headache keep me from worshiping God. Can't no broken finger keep me from flipping through the scriptures. Can't no upset stomach keep me from giving God praise anyhow. This woman couldn't even stand up straight, but bent over. She walked in the synagogue and say, I just got to get there. And that's where our attitude needs to be. We need to always trust in God because the day we continue to trust God in our pain may be the very day that we find ourselves at the right place at the right time that would change our lives for the better. So as Christians, we just need to keep moving forward. We just need to continue to hold on to the hand of God, his unchanging hand. We just need to keep moving forward. We just need to keep doing his will. Your deliverance is coming. And so are we doing our part to meet not just our problems, getting those fixed and getting those resolved and applying the prescription to ourselves, but are we the good witnesses of Jesus that we are able to see people with problems and then tell them about the prescription that we apply to ourselves? Because the thing about this prescription is that it doesn't even matter what your blood type is. It doesn't even matter what your nationality is. It doesn't even matter what your skin color is. If you are a soul in the body, the blood of Jesus can take away your sin, no matter how big or how small or how you feel about it. Will you trust him like this woman trusted him? Get your sin problem taken care of. You've heard and believed. Do, you've heard God's word. Do you believe it according to Acts 15, 7? If so, give up sin, repent, so that there can be a renewing in your life. Acts 3, 19. Will you confess him? According to Acts chapter 8, verse 37, will you be baptized and have your sins washed away this day according to Acts chapter 22, verse 16? If you are a Christian, you need to remain one. And if you have not been walking according to to the orders and the prescription by the great physician. This is your opportunity to make things right with him because he can still, you can still come to him. See, oftentimes we fail to, we, we, sometimes it don't even cross our minds that nurses and doctors and surgeons, they got primary physicians too. We think that because we don't practice medicine that we're the only ones that need help. No, even people that practice medicine Still got to go to people that practice medicine in order to get help and healing in their situations as well. I mean, even psychologists talk to other psychologists. After you sat on the psychologist's couch, that psychologist go to another office and they sit on somebody else's couch to talk about how jacked up your situation was when you sat on their couch because they need help too. And so, if you are a Christian, it's not a shame to say, I need help. I'm out here trying to help other people. But the devil is trying to break me down. And if the devil breaks me down, then I'm no good to anybody else. So now is the time to do what the airlines always tell us to do. In the case of a loss of cabin pressure, you go ahead and put your mask on first. Then assist the person sitting next to you. This is our opportunity to get ourselves right. And just like we tell people to go to the great position, this is our moment to come to the great position. Come to the great position while together we stand and sing the song that has been selected.